Hi, this is Ben Shank. I'm your host of Mountain Meister. One of the podcast sponsors is Steo. They're based out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and they make a really versatile line of outdoors apparel. It's stuff that you can use on the mountain, whether you're skiing or climbing, all the way down to apres ski or even going out to dinner at night. It's really, really neat stuff. I had the opportunity to learn more about the company from the founder, Steve Sullivan. This is our conversation. Well, the founding of Steo occurred um, after the demise of my former company. Uh, my former company was called Cloudvale. And I uh, attempted to purchase that company back out of uh, ownership um, through a large private equity fund that also owned Spider, and I was unsuccessful. And so I took a little time um, after leaving that company and and decided to do do it differently. And the the two biggest principal differences are one, that we were going to focus on the direct consumer market. So, um, and then the, the second one was we were going to focus on, on the consumer um, within that market and let the consumer help decide what the product line would ultimately be. Um, so, we, meaning that we're getting such uh, we have a much, you know, d- more direct connection with our consumers than when you're in the wholesale channel and, you know, you're removed by the retailer. So we, we went out and we designed and developed a line and then we launched um, an e-commerce platform, a brick and mortar retail store and a cataloging business all within a month of, of each other. And and it's been you know, really fascinating uh, to watch the response to that. And one of the greatest things about it is you put a product out on the market and you immediately find out if that product has legs. So unlike, again, the, the long lag with the wholesale channel where you go from, you know, the sales meeting or design and development to a sales meeting to then trying to sell into the retail stores and then, another nine months until the retail stores have either sold it or not, we put a product on the market and we find out within about 30 days whether that product is going to have some modicum of success or it's going to have great success. And then we build upon those product platforms. That's amazing. Um, And that's, yeah, and that's probably been the, the most exciting part about being in the direct consumer business. And the reason I decided to do that was that, um, my former company also had um, some direct consumer business. And one of the things we started to find as we got larger and larger is that the products that, that were a little more eclectic, that were a little more highly designed, that were a little more interesting, we were selling really well in our direct channels and in our retail store, but we were not able to place those in the wholesale channel. And that was really an impetus saying to me that we – we can go out and be different and push design farther and, and textiles farther. Um, and the consumers, uh, will like that. And, and so far so good. So tell me about, I want to hear this, the nitty gritty of listening to the consumer, because that's how you'll drive business. Tell me about uh, a specific example, maybe of when you were first starting out of how you listen to the consumer. Um, I have a great example. The, the first year we, we came out with a, uh, a waterproof breathable collection called the Environ, which is still in our line. But at that time, we were using a, a much different textile that was much more expensive. And we went out to the consumer market and, and priced that garment at, at about the jacket, for, for an example, at $650. Hmm. And the consumer immediately spoke to us and said, great jacket, too expensive. And so the feedback we were getting from people that did purchase it was, was that really liked it, but we didn't like the value we got for the $650. So we re-engineered that garment over the course of the next year with a different textile that was still a high, high performance textile, but we're able to get it in at a consumer price point where the consumer thought that the price value equation lined up better. Mm -hmm. And that has now become one of our best selling winter jackets. Which one so, is it? Um, that's the Environ jacket, which is a fully waterproof, breathable uh, ski piece, ski, mm-hmm. snowboard, you know, snow sports piece. And <clears throat> without having that feedback being so 
quick, you know, I mean, we, we got that feedback within the first month of putting this product on the market. We wouldn't have known to re-engineer that garment to satisfy the consumer's value proposition. And so that was a really immediate piece of feedback that we now, you know, we apply to almost everything that we build. So if we get consumer feedback that like great shirt, awesome textile, great price point, thanks so much. We know we're onto it, right? If we get it back, great shirt, um, great textile. I think you guys are a little too expensive for this style. Then we take a hard look at that. Now we don't, you know, we have to also factor in that we have margins and, and, um, and, you know, a business to run. So we can't just hand stuff out, (laughs) but, but we listen to our consumers and we get such immediate and direct feedback from our consumers mostly positive, which is great that we're able to make changes really rapidly and makes us a lot more nimble than being in the wholesale channel. Absolutely. And another advantage of going direct to consumer is the cost savings for the business. What would a uh, comparable quality piece, how much more expensive would it be if you are to go through the retailer? Well, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of costs to running a direct consumer business. Hmm. So, um, quite honestly, in a lot of ways, it's more expensive than running a wholesale business. Interesting. Um, mainly, yeah, mainly because you have to forecast your inventory. Hmm. You don't have the advantage of, of purchase orders sitting in your lap mm-hmm. so that you know what sold for the season. Um, I would say that the average cost would be 25% higher if we were in the wholesale channel. Interesting. Okay. So passing that. So it's that. not it's not it's not 50% or anything, uh-huh. but it's about 20 to 25% higher. Well, and then you add on the, so the the 20% off with the code Meister at checkout, and then all of a sudden you're getting right. close to 50%. Exactly. <laughs> and so so the the interesting thing what it allows us to do is use textiles higher quality textiles in some of our products that I may not have used in my previous company. Mm -hmm. So if a jacket is going to be $400 um, from us, that jacket would have been about $500 going out to the wholesale channel. We're able to, you know, value engineer more value into the, into the product by using a higher quality textile Mm -hmm. to, for, for that application. I loved what you said about feedback earlier. Uh, you might like this analogy. I was reading uh, this book called Zen Golf. Do you, are you a golfer by any chance? Uh, I am. Okay. I'm not supposed to talk about golf, but I love golf. <laughs> uh, this analogy with golf is uh, when you putt, you always receive feedback, immediate feedback on uh, on whether you hit it too hard or you didn't uh, read the green correctly. And uh, imagine all the decisions that we make in life where we don't receive those immediate feedback. It would be like hitting the ball and never seeing where it ends up relative to the hole. That's a, that's a great analogy. And I think that analogy could even be stretched further to, you know, the people that develop a routine, um, learn to line up their putts properly, learn to understand Mm -hmm. and how to read the greens. Those are all kind of the business elements, right? Of putting. No, good analogy. I'm curious, what, where did Steo come from? What is the origin of the name? I like it. Um, it well, it, it, it hasn't been widely uh, broadcast, but the name is an abbreviation of my first name, Stephen, in Gaelic. So my first name in, in, in Gaelic, because I'm Irish, uh-huh. is, I'm Irish-Scottish, is, is Steo Fenn, S-T-I-O-F-A-N. And... Okay. A buddy of mine, we were scrapping for names. You know, the, so many names have been chewed up in intellectual property right. land these days, and especially shorter names, which we thought w- was really important, and also names that we could get, you know, the URL, et cetera. He, he showed up to visit me uh, one summer, you know, five years ago, and he said, hey, you know, you're Irish. Why don't you look up some uh, – you're Irish and Scottish. Why don't you look up some Gaelic names for – wolf or bear or elk or deer or some or mountain and i started going through a bunch of those names and by god if if a lot of them weren't taken in the intellectual property world and then i looked up my own name and another buddy said well steel is kind of cool and you know it doesn't really mean anything Uh except that it it has an attachment to you 
to me. He, he was talking to me mm-hmm. and that, you know, it, it's just a cool name. And so I searched it up and I was able to get really clean IP from a trademark standpoint. Um, I actually ended up having to buy the URL from somebody though, <laughs> believe it or not. Well, who, who'd you have to buy it from? I, you know, one of those, one of those guys probably back in the early two thousands when they, they had those yeah. web crawlers that went around and aggregated names, right. somebody had just been camped on it. And so I had to pay for the URL. <laughs> All right. Well, you got it now. Um, I want to, I want to move into the, the function and the fashion and the fit. I, I have noticed when, when I purchase clothing, uh, for some reason, the the lower quality and the cheaper clothing not only doesn't feel as good as the higher quality clothing but it also the fit is very different and it seems like if there it has a more restrictive fit in like uh it doesn't accommodate for a bunch of different body shapes whereas uh the higher quality clothing just just seems to fit better uh across every body type but it doesn't seem like that should make the product more expensive what what is it about a high quality piece of clothing that makes it fit so well? Well, I think it's the amount of time and attention people put into it. And, mm-hmm. you know, if it's the one thing I really had going for me starting this company is that, you know, I'd been in the apparel business for 15 years already. And so I, I knew how important fit was. I knew how important fit was going to be, especially in the direct consumer market, mm-hmm. um, because you obviously want to mitigate returns. You want to get somebody the right fit first. Um, and so we spend an inordinate amount of time on fit. And I think that's probably the, one of the big differences. We, we not only have completely customized mannequins, fit mannequins that we use that we spec and, you know, there, there these, there's this one mannequin company in Hong Kong that just does an amazing job and they're, they're the highest quality mannequins, all the fashion companies use them, et cetera. So we not only spent a good bit of money getting our fit right with those mannequins, but then we use um, three different male fit models and three different female fit models consistently um, every season to fit our clothing. So, and, and we also make sure that those people have, although they, we want them to conform to some kind of fit standard, we always make sure that there's a little bit of a difference in their body types, right? So one of them might have a longer inseam. One of them might have a, a you know, a, a larger measurement at hip than they do at waist, et cetera. And I think the main thing is that we spend a lot of time on fit. We think a little bit differently than most outdoor companies. We think a little bit more from the regard of being a tailor as opposed to just trying to fit the widest variety of people. Mm. Um, we've been accused a little bit of being maybe a little heavy on the athletic side. So a little more of a fitted profile, but that's what our customer base, exactly. um, I think has appreciated in our fit. You gotta, uh, yeah. If you're providing to the outdoors consumer, especially, uh, the active outdoors consumer, it seems like you, you would want to fit the athletic person. Yeah, and I and I think that the, the big difference too is that so many people are getting um, there. There's all sorts of new ways to get fit these days, right? It used to be, you know, you were a, a runner or a cyclist mm-hmm. or what have you, but those sports have now blown up and cascaded into, you know, cyclocross is a huge sport now, and the whole CrossFit movement is a huge thing, and um, the warrior sports, and so we. We've been really cognizant of saying, you know, there is a customer out there because there are so many more people that are paying attention to their health and their well-being and their fitness levels that wants a better fit. And so I, I think that's that's the main thing. I mean, we still, you know, we still have to make our clothes fit the widest variety of people we can. Mm-hmm. But I would say the widest variety of athletes is who we mostly target. It's amazing. I'm I'm learning so much. I, I, this is one of the reasons why I love doing these interviews. Is just uh, personal. Personally, I love to learn about this. Tell me about the uh, designs that you pick. How how does what kind of thought goes into that? Well, the whole premise of our design philosophy is is rooted in versatility, and and I think we've done an excellent job of of not only communicating that but of providing that. So. A great example would be we have a very popular shirt called the Eddy. And the Eddy shirt is a um, pseudo-Western style snap 
uh, button-up shirt that could be worn. I, I in fact, have it on today um, in the office. And yet I also used it to ski the entire Hout route in April with my college buddies. And what it is is it, it's a, a, a wind-resistant wicking shirt, but it also happens to have this lifestyle appeal. And so that's a good example of a product where we found a textile that had a performance characteristic that we wanted, and then we, we applied a design ethos, which is versatility, into that textile and came up with a product. And that's that's very much how we approach a good percentage of our line. You know, there, there's definitely some more specific products, like our technical outerwear is designed for top-of-the-mountain type of use and may not cascade into streetwear. Um, but the vast majority, I'd say 70-ish percent of our line, is is focused on bringing technical textiles into the mountain lifestyle so that they can cascade throughout a lot of different activities that you might do mm -hmm. you mentioned you're wearing the eddie shirt right now what does your closet look like i'm so curious about this do you do you just have steel everywhere how do you uh, wh what does your closet look like um well what i do is um i recycle my closet every year um so at, well every season actually so each each new season that comes out I get all of our new products so that because I'm obviously the head of the company. And so I want to be in our most recent product. And then I either give away, um, the product to friends and family or, um, any wide variety of people. Um, I've even taken a couple big boxes down to our local, uh, Episcopal church thrift store. And I'm sure there were some super stoked people yeah. when that happened. <laughs> um, but so I, I basically recycle it because otherwise you just build up, you know, there's just too many, too many things. Uh -huh. I mean, we have our, our line has over 120 styles now. So, you know, I'd have, a, have to have a bigger closet. Right. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a podcast host and producer. And sometimes I, I like have trouble listening to other podcasts because I'm always like focused on the production side or how the host is saying something instead of listening to what they actually say. When you wear clothing, uh, does something similar happen to you where you, you like, can't, you, you're thinking too much about wearing the clothing? Yeah, I'm, I'm by far the most critical person in here. And, and I think that's a big part of my job. And so almost every time I wear a piece of our clothing, which is every day, I am thinking about, oh, should the arm's eye on this sleeve be a quarter inch, you know, deeper, or should this sleeve length be, you know, a half inch shorter, or is this snap working the right way, or can I roll this sleeve up the right way? Um, is this hood functioning properly with a helmet on? You know, I'm I'm constantly sending texts to our product development crew. Um, <laughs> in, f in fact. They get they just have a log of all of it so that we can you know review it at meetings because you know I don't remember everything but I or get it out to them immediately so they know what I'm thinking about but yeah I'm hyper hyper critical of everything we make Sully thanks so much I, I've learned a bunch I've really really enjoyed this conversation uh, twenty percent off for our listeners and from what I have seen online it is tough to get a 20% discount on Steel Clothing. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Hey, thanks for listening to this segment. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and you learned a lot. Go to Stio, S-T-I-O dot com to learn more. And when you're ready, use the code Meister, M-E-I-S-T-E-R at checkout. You'll receive 20% off. Again, that's the promo code Meister at checkout for 20% off. If you have any questions at all, feel free to shoot me an email, ben at mtnmeister.com. Steo sent me some product, and I'd be happy to share my thoughts with you.